You can turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, and uh, we're going to read verses 6 through 10 to get started here in just a bit. Well, let's go ahead and read that now, shall we? It says, anyone who receives instruction in the Word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows, and the one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all the people, especially to those who belong in the family of believers. Now, this morning, uh, if you're... Uh, if you're not yet a Christ follower, or maybe you haven't, uh, uh, you haven't, uh, well, you haven't crossed over, or maybe um, you're thinking pretty serious about this whole thing about walking with Christ, but you're not quite sure about it all yet. Well, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking you can listen this morning, and there's going to be some of the principles that we're going to talk about that are actually going to apply to you, and that's a good thing. As a matter of fact, almost everything I say this morning will apply to you. But to be honest with you, I don't I'm not I didn't really think you were going to be here this morning, and I'm glad you are, but I'm talking to the believers cuz this book that we're sort of using as a springboard to talk this morning about the harvest is uh is written to believers. And so it's always important when we study the scripture to recognize who the primary people that you first are uh, addressing uh, it comes to now. We're not doing a complete exegesis of this particular passage. This is, would be considered more of a topical uh, subject that we're looking relative to the fact that this is Labor Day, and and loosely translated, laboring is what you do, the things you invest in in life, and so uh, that's sort of uh, the bent we're going to take this morning. But again, if you're not a believer, I want you to listen because these things will apply to you. But the flip side of this is this. For the believers, I really want you to listen carefully because a lot of times when I was growing up and I heard somebody say, you know, you reap what you sow, we were always talking about all the bad people that didn't go to church. You know, those people out there, they're reaping what they're sowing. You know, they're really bad. No offense, guys, if you're not like a church guy, but that's what I grew up with. And uh, <clears throat> so I spent a lot of years thinking that the only people that reaped what they sowed were people who didn't follow Christ. People that didn't go to church. And then I was shocked to find out that it applied to me too. And then I got even more shocked when I found out that the first teaching was given to the household of God, the people, the family of God, the people who were believers. So lest you are, you grew up, if you happen to have been a, uh, been walking with Christ a long time, and in your mind, this is, you can kind of bypass this one. This is an easy teaching. You already know this teaching. It didn't really apply that much to you. It's for all the bad people. Uh, okay, you don't get off the hook now, see? Because this teaching is primarily for you. I thought Arn Bjorndal was going to jump out of his shorts this morning when he saw this basketball. If you don't know, he's kind of a coach, coach, coach. And then it went by Amy Hunt, and I said, Amy, I'm going to ask you to do a demonstration of the basketball, thinking she'd be embarrassed. And she starts to reach for the ball, going, well, you know, okay. If you ask a basketball person about doing anything with basketball... They will be happy to get on stage and demonstrate every bit of the skills that you've got. Now, I don't have any skills, but I have a brother, Tommy, who's eight, six years older than I am. And when Tommy, Tommy, I don't think he made it much past 5'10", uh, uh, but he started as a freshman in college playing basketball, and every year he played, his team won a state championship. Tommy had several unique abilities. One of them was, at just he was, might have been a little over 5'10", he could dunk the ball. Pretty impressive, huh? Not only that, he had a fadeaway jump shot that I can't do because I would fall backwards if I did what he did that went straight up in the air. We even had a center that was played on our team that was 7 feet 4 inches tall and he could not block Tommy's jump shot because he jumped backwards and the ball went straight up in the air and he shot 75% in his jump shots. So, pretty sharp guy. State championship basketball. And then he had this other thing. He had perfect timing. And the, you guys sports people, there's this play called an alley-oop where a guy goes up and he acts like he's going to shoot, but what he's doing is he's throwing it near the goal for the big guy so he can drop it in. It was amazing. 
every time he got it. He, he had the perfect ability to set people up. And it was no wonder they won their state championship basketball. But the funny thing about Tommy is he was this really little scrawny guy. Not only was he short, he looked like he could blow him over with a... Because he just didn't have any meat on his bones at all. And he would walk out on the court, and, you know, the shorts that they wore, even back then, it looked like somebody had given him uh, a pair of pants from a man that weighed about 300 pounds. Just these little sticks were walking out on the court, and Tommy would be bouncing the ball, and he was a guard, <clears throat> excuse me, and they actually, depending on who it was, they would actually let him do the jump shot because he could jump, uh, you know, the jump for the ball because he could jump so high. And you could hear from the crowd, everybody's mocking my brother. Hey, could you not find them any taller than that? We've got a few you can borrow from our team. Everybody's trying to mock him. But then he would start to play. And the guys used to joke on the team, and they would say, Tommy was a force, not only a force to be reckoned with, he was a law of nature. When he got the ball in his hands, you were going to lose. He was an excellent player. And all of a sudden, the big reputation after two years of this was, is nobody mocked Tommy anymore when he walked onto the court. Because everybody heard about this scrawny little toothpick guy that could dunk the ball and that nobody could block his shot. When we come to this book in Galatians, it says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. He doesn't say don't mock God. He says God can't be mocked. Because whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. Now, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Just like my brother, but actually way more important than my brother, God cannot be mocked. And the reason He can't be mocked is this. What God says goes. And you can say, well, I don't believe that whole if you reap what you sow thing. I don't really buy that thing. Well, okay, you go ahead and don't buy that. And just like my brother who used to dunk the ball in front of guys a lot taller than him, God is going to show you that when He says something and those principles go into place, you will experience them whether or not you believe them or not. I have a friend of mine that used to say it like this. I don't worry about proving whether or not the Bible's true anymore or whether or not the truths of Scripture are true anymore because life itself will prove that what God says is the truth, right? Now, there are some of you that may not have experienced that yet. It's just that I have. I'm not better than you. I've actually tried to buck the system more times than I've probably tried to follow the system. And sooner or later, I started learning something. What God says is true, period. And the way He says things are going to operate. And so this morning, we're going to look briefly together at this whole issue of uh, you reap what you sow. And as we think about that, just remember, God can't be mocked. The first principle, there's this principle that God has, and it's throughout the Old through the New Testament, is this. And again, if you think you know the law of the harvest, this is not <clears throat> excuse me. This is not considered one of the more profound teachings in Scripture. It's just one of those that we keep. I find people keep bumping up against. They actually sort of convince themselves that it's not that big a deal. And so, the first principle of the law of the harvest that God has lined out is that, is that you reap what you sow. Now, if you were to go to the, to the book of Genesis, uh, and and actually, it's a huge passage of Scripture, so we can't cover it all. But you'd see the story in Genesis chapter 27 of a fellow named uh, Jacob. Jacob and Esau, they were two twins. How many have heard of them before? A few of you, okay. Well, basically, this was it. They were two twins. Esau got, or Jacob got his name, and his name sort of means the idea of it's one who grabs hold of the heel. When they were coming out of the birth canal, Jacob wanted to one-up his brother, and he spent his whole life trying to steal from his brother what God had already given him. Fast forward, it comes time that his dad's dying and he's supposed to get the spiritual blessing from his dad, which was not only his finances, but there was some kind of spiritual thing that would happen that blessed him uh, throughout his life and with his children, and it went to the eldest son. Jacob and his mama were afraid that he wasn't going to get the blessing, and so they deceived his dad because es- es- uh, Esau was a hairy man. That's what his um, um, uh, name meant. And so he had hair all over him. And, of course, Jacob was a, a fair guy, and he didn't, have, he didn't have a lot of hair in him. He wasn't all that ruddy. And so <clears throat> what ended up happening was is they killed a goat, 
put the skin on his neck and on his arms, and then Mama fixed this really good meal because Dad was about to die and he was going to give the blessing. He said, so go kill me an animal so I can bless you, Esau. While Esau was out hunting, Jacob and Mama fixed the best goat stew he'd ever had and took him in, and he says, I hear the voice of Jacob, but I feel the body of Esau, and I smell Esau. And the long story short, he ended up, and that's in verses uh, uh, 22 and 23, it's the voice of Jacob, but the hands of Esau, and he ended up giving him the blessing. And his brother really wasn't all that happy about that. As a matter of fact, he had to leave town because he was afraid that his brother was going to kill him. He deceived his brother on his father's deathbed by killing a lamb and putting the skin around him. Now let's fast forward. Because this fellow named Jacob finally became another man, became a man of God and he had 12, uh, he, he moved on through, his brother didn't kill him, there was some level of restoration there, but he ended up getting married and he had 12 sons. And one of his sons was a fellow named Joseph. And your kids learn about it if they've been to Sunday school before or if you grew up in Sunday school. And it was Joseph and his coat of many colors. And his brothers were jealous of the, because he was the favorite of this fellow. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so they decided they were going to sell him into slavery. And this is how they let Dad know to get away with it. They sold his brother into slavery after having thrown him in a pit, sold him into slavery, took his coat of many colors, killed a goat and spread the blood all over it and took it to Dad and said, Do you recognize this coat, Dad? Dad said, Yes, that's my son's coat. That's Joseph's coat. And he weeped because he'd lost his son. The same man that was the father of Joseph was this fellow we now call Jacob. You see, in exactly the same way he had deceived his brother, it now came back on him and he was deceived in exactly the same way and it brought great, brought great sorrow to his life. Now, so there's first of all the principle of you, you reap exactly what you sow. In a positive way, there's a fellow that I've been working with here recently, working with in the sense of that I've made acquaintance, and I, uh, he's actually tried to rip me off. I'm not going to go into a bunch of details, but uh, let's just say he's tried to put one or two over on me. And this time I obeyed the Lord. I don't always. This time I obeyed the Lord and was kind to this fella. And it's really interesting. You know what happened this last week? He says, listen, do y'all ever do church up there at that big building? And I said, what big building? He says, that one that sits up there behind that brick house that's out on Searfoss. And I said, well, yeah, actually, once in a while we try to have a service and do some stuff. And he says, well... You know, I've been thinking that maybe I, there, there's some things in my life I might need to get in order. I'm loving it. Because the kindness that I've demonstrated to this guy, because I listen to the Lord, has now begun to produce a thirst or desire in him that maybe, and I've never challenged him about one issue re relative to his life. So you see, in a very positive way, we can't experience that. I'm not saying that happens that directly all the time. I'm saying that it can happen in that very particular way in a fairly short period of time. The negative is this. In Galatians chapter 6 that we read earlier, it says this, the one that sows to the flesh is going to read a lot of havoc in their life. <clears throat> now let me give you a couple of quick examples. There are people that I find that they only want comfort in their life. And so what they do is they create situations around them so they don't have to look at the things that they're doing in a negative fashion. In other words, they kind of ignore it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. They only want to do the things that make them comfortable. Now, just a couple of three quick things uh, uh, in, the, in the life of not just this body, but every body, I've ever, uh, body of believers I've been connected with. One of the things that I've noticed is, is that in every church I've been uh, involved with that there have been people who gossip, including me. And when I'm gossiping, I feel completely justified in gossiping about whoever I'm gossiping about. And what I've recognized is it always comes back to bite me. I always end up hearing about it somewhere along the way and I end up in more trouble than I... Than, uh, uh, than I thought that I was going to get. There's a, there's a natural consequence of what I was do. So that would be one example. Here's another one. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are people that I, I, that I have noticed uh, over the years that uh, uh, just ignore the good thing that it is that God has called them to do. Well, do you know the book of James says to know that a good thing but not to do it, it's sin? Well, guess what? According to the Scriptures, there's going to be a consequence that comes to me 
and respect to that. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I'm attempting to do anything, speaking of this in a negative fashion, that God has very clearly said to me, this is not the way to do life. And if I go ahead and choose to move in that direction, there's always a consequence that's coming. Sometimes that consequence comes right away. Sometimes it comes later, which we'll talk about in just a few, a few minutes. But I reap exactly what I sow, whether it's deception or unkindness or whatever the case may be, I find myself. So that's the first principle of the law of the harvest. The second principle of the law of the harvest is, is this, that you reap more than what you sow. Now, we're going to jump ship on, Joseph, uh, on uh, Jacob now and talk to you from 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, in, uh, beginning in verse 1, we see the famous phrase that says it was the time of year when all the men were supposed to go off to war, and they did not. And David went out on his uh, balcony, saw Bathsheba. Do you remember this story? He saw her bathing, and he caught her into himself. He slept with her, and she got pregnant. He tried to hide the thing through a whole series of things, and when that didn't work, she, he sent her husband, Uriah the Hittite, out on the front of the battle. You know Why? so he would get killed, so he wouldn't have to deal with the thing. Everybody with me so far? So, he's, so he tries to hide it, and, and he thinks he's kind of gotten away with it, but then, of course, the prophet of God comes, and he challenges him. And an interesting thing happens. If you go to chapter 12, verses 10 through 13, some things are said after Nathan the prophet comes, because he's caught. And Nathan the prophet says this, because you have killed Uriah the Hittite to cover up your sin of sleeping with his wife, he said, the sword is never going to pass from your house. The second principle of the harvest is this, is that the things that I do, that I choose to do today, that are outside the principle in which God has chosen for my life, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes I reap more than what I sow. I don't just reap exactly what I've sown. So, for instance... I plant apples, I get apples. I plant potatoes, I get potatoes. But uh, uh, any farmer knows that when you put something in the ground, they're counting on the fact that you get a lot more of the thing that you get out of the ground, right? Okay, I told you this is not rocket science. But this is what you, it's important for you to remember. With David, as a result of the fact that he had this man killed, even though he did not uh, die at that particular point, the sword never passed from his family. In other words, people were killing each other all the time as a result of the consequence of David's sin. But there was another thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. In uh, verse 11, it says this, What you've done in secret, by, and this is 2 Samuel chapter 12, uh, verse uh, 11. He says, What you've done in secret, what you've done behind doors now, all the rest of the people, uh, the, the, the women or the wives in your family, uh, someone's going to do the very same thing you did to the other women in your family. And it's going to be done in public display and everybody's going to know about it. You see, sometimes when I sow something, I reap more than what I sow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, lest you think I've just completely gone negative on you and, and uh, we're ready to just pull out the gun and start shooting everybody that's ever sinned. In verse chapter 13... There's a, uh, excuse me, verse 13 in, in 2 Samuel chapter 12. <clears throat> he says this. The Lord, this is in the middle of him telling him that all this destruction is coming to his life and family. He says, the Lord has already taken away your sin. You're not going to die. I want you to stick with me as we talk about the natural consequence of this law of the harvest. Because even though David had a lot of things happen in his life that I guarantee you he wasn't planning on, what he didn't experience... And, and some of this was relative to his sense of repentance and his broken heart. He says, the Lord says, I've already taken away your sin relative to your uh, repentance. And you're not going to die, but there's going to be some natural consequences that are following. There's going to be some things that happen as a result, and it's going to be way more than you ever anticipated. Well, in the positive way, James says, it like, or excuse me, 1 Peter 4, 8 says this, Love covers a multitude of sins. Love, loving deeply... And loving well covers up a multitude of sins. It creates an atmosphere of respect around you. And people may see that you have failure in your life, but they acknowledge the reality of the fact that you're loving well and it, it meets a need within them. But on the negative side of things, forgiveness, <clears throat> excuse me, for um, uh, when I sin, even though I receive the forgiveness of God, it doesn't do away with the natural consequence of sin. 
And here's the problem that I'm having. How many of you, and just ask the question here, how many of you ever made this statement like I've made this statement before? Well, you know, everybody makes mistakes. Okay, I, I said that two weeks ago. Has anybody in here ever made that statement to somebody? Okay, thank you for being honest. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Now, the truth is, is sometimes I, I've said that when I wanted people who were kind of beating up on themselves too much and too long to go, hey, look, you know, don't just beat yourself up for the rest of your life. God forgives you. Move on with your life and so on, right? And that's okay. And you'd understand why I'd say that. But you know what? I've also said that sometimes when I didn't want to deal with the person that I was talking with because I knew it was going to be messy if I started talking to them about, hey, listen, man, you need to get serious about this. Have any of you ever been in a position where you're talking to someone and they've sinned or they are sinning and they really don't give a rip and they don't care that you think that what they're doing is wrong? Anybody in here? Ever? ever anybody? And you, and you're going, okay, 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 what do I say, what do I not say? And there's just this real awkward kind of a thing going on, right? And so sometimes I used to, well, you know, everybody makes mistakes. And the truth is, I think you're wrong. The Scriptures say you're wrong, and you're not dealing with it, but I don't want to deal with it. So once and for all, I want to get clear about something. While I appreciate and celebrate the forgiveness of Christ all the time, just because a person has been forgiven me included, from the things that I do wrong. It does not give me a license to say, okay, hey, listen, all the, consequ- all the consequences are gone. I never have to deal with that again. Are you tracking with me? If that was true, it was specifically said of David, I've taken your sins away, but David was still dealing with the reality of the consequences of his life. One of the things I'm really struggling with right now is there's a lot of people in life that seem to think, I just need to be, you know, God forgive me and I'm done. I don't am not out to punish you, and I definitely don't want to be in charge of going after you because I don't want you in charge of coming after me. But there is a reality of the things that I choose in life. God will not be mocked. He will forgive me. He will embrace me. He will take me to heaven uh, with Him, and He will continue to work with me. But God is dead serious about your obedience. And an and end result of sin that I do at times is that I end up experiencing a lot more than what I've sown. <clears throat> I don't like looking at the natural consequences of my sin. One of my friends puts it like this. I'm not worried about God punishing uh, people for sin because sin is its own consequence. You follow that? How many of you have experienced that before? You've got plenty of punishment from the natural consequence of the things that you chose to do that God was telling you not to do. The last thing is this. You reap later than what you sow. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 1 Kings chapter 21, you have the story of Ahab and Jezebel. The long story short of Jez, Ahab was considered to be the most wicked king up to that point in, in Israel's history. And he thought that he needed to make a political alliance with a neighboring uh, group of people. And so this is what he ended up doing. He married Jezebel, who was a pagan princess. And she actually worshipped a pagan god, and she built a pagan temple house uh, thing right, right in the middle of Jerusalem. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, as the story moves on, they got more and more wicked. Naboth uh, had a vineyard in, at the summer house that uh, Ahab had, and he said, I want your vineyard to plant a, a vegetable garden, but I, and I'll give you a bigger vineyard. But Naboth wasn't going to do that because God had said, don't sell the original lands of your fathers. And so he said no. And so... Ahab started whining because he couldn't get what he wanted. And Jezebel didn't like his whining, so she said, I'll fix that. So she trumped up this big story, got the guy in trouble, and got him stoned. And, and uh, he died uh, right there at his vineyard. <clears throat> God sent a prophet to this fellow named Ahab, and he said, something's going to happen. He said, because of what you've done, and, the same, and this is just a little bit graphic, but in, 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 in what you've done, the very place where the blood was licked up by the dog where you killed Naboth, the same thing's going to happen to you. And it's also going to happen to your wife Jezebel. Hmm. Well, you know what? It was years later before something happened to Ahab. And if he was like me, and I'd gotten that from the prophet of God, this is what I would have been thinking. Every time I heard a dog bark, I'd have been looking over my shoulder to see what was coming. 
But you know, after a few years, and you don't experience the consequence of what you're choosing, you kind of go, whoop, whoop. Yeah, I was just a dog. And after several years, you don't even notice the dog is barking. But sure enough, a few years later, Ahab's out in the battle. A random arrow goes out and hits him in the one place in his armor that could kill him, and he dies. And they take the chariot back and wash it off. And guess what happens? The dogs come. And a full 14 years later after that, Jezebel is involved in this... uh, this big commotion and the bottom line is she falls out of a tower and in exactly the place where God said that she was going to die and the dogs would come for her blood as well it happened because they had killed a man for the luxury of having a vegetable garden garden and tried to mock the God of the universe I want to you to know something I know that often I'm called a really positive guy but I also have to tell the truth There are times I think you're probably like me. I consider choosing things that I know God's Holy Spirit is saying, Tim, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, because I know there's no immediate consequence coming from it. But I want you to get the third law of the harvest. Here's the principle. Sometimes I reap later than what I sow. Now, in a very positive way, that's an excellent thing, because I have the blessing of God... In James uh, chapter 5, verse 7, he says, Be patient in suffering and wait till the Lord's coming. There is life that's coming when the Lord comes at the end. This is not the only place I'll ever be. But also, there's a place of comfort and there's a place of stability that's created, created in me today when Christ shows up in my life today. But from a negative standpoint, many think because of the consequences not coming now uh, <clears throat> that I can go ahead and do what I want. My brother, who was the great basketball player, If he were here today, he would tell you this is true, and I have permission to share this. He has five girls. And my brother makes me look like I'm mean. He is such a nice guy. But you know, he'd tell you that he never told his girls no, not even one time. And to this day, right now, he's dealing with two of his girls who have now moved back into his life because they can't even make a simple decision for themselves, either financially or emotionally. You see, my brother thought that saying no and being a nice guy was the way to do life. But Christ calls us something else as parents, right? I want you to get this. You may be in a place in your life where you're ignoring something of the prompting of God. And right now, nobody knows what's going on. The whole thing's done in secret. It's not an issue, and you're going... Hey, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and do this either because it feels good or because it's something I want to do or whatever else may be. But I want you to understand something. I say this out of compassion, not because I am trying to beat you up. The law of the harvest is that sometimes you reap later than what you sow. And that thing that you so are treasuring to hang on to right now, that thing you will not yield to the Lord about, may come back to bite you in a big way. As we close, I want you to recognize this, though. There's one last rule of the harvest that goes beyond all of these rules. And this rule is this. You reap what Jesus has sown because of Christ's sacrifice. Do you understand that the Scriptures teach in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, that you can come if you're weak and heavy laden or burdened down, and He'll give you rest? In 1 John chapter 1, 7 to 9, He says this, If I confess my sins... He not only forgives me, but He cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Meaning, He doesn't just forgive me, He actually makes it possible for me to move on in obedience from this place on. Do you understand you reap what Christ has sown? In John chapter 14, verse 6, He says this, that I'm going to give you a counselor to live within you, and I'll now give you a prompting and a person that will direct you and alert you if you're in a place where you're not ought to be. The problem is you've got to listen to what He's saying. In Romans chapter 6, verse 6, He says you're no longer chained to sin. In John 14, 23 to 24, I want you to turn there with me and we'll, we'll close this down. John chapter 14. Read with me, beginning in verse 22. He says, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and show him my 
mercy. He who loves me will obey my commands. If you love me, will you come and make your home here, Lord? <clears throat> and, he, and he has. But if you do not love the Lord, you demonstrate that by not obeying his teaching. Now let's just bring this down to the end and close. Here's my concern. My concern, especially with a simple teaching like the law of the harvest, is that people just go, well, yeah, that was a nice, you know, it was a nice refresher. That, that, that really worked well for me. And I walk out and I don't consider where I currently am relative to this teaching. And so I just wonder of the people that are in here, including me, is there a thing right now a thing that the Spirit of God... I'm talking to believers here now. A thing that the Spirit of God has touched on you and He's saying for you, this thing is out of order. And I fully intend to move you into obedience. You see, there are many of us that mock God because when Christ deposited His life in you, this is what He was saying. It's a foregone conclusion now that you're no longer chained to sin and you actually have the ability to obey and you didn't have the ability to obey before. And so if you find yourself not obeying, and I'm not talking about sinless perfection, I'm not talking about being accepted because of my obedience because I'm accepted because of Christ's life, but I'm talking about this. The Scriptures teach that if I have Christ's life in me, then His Holy Spirit will prompt me in the things that I need to move on in, right? And... Anything He shows me or He reveals to me, He intends to move me into obedience. It might take a while. I may struggle against that. But He's going to move me into obedience. And so here's... I'd just like to dump this thing right in your lap. Where are you in relationship to the things that you know that Christ has actually called you to? I don't care that you tell anybody else right now. The thing that He's called you to specifically in terms of obedience. Because if you walk out of here this morning and choose to not listen to what the Holy Spirit's telling you in terms about the specific matter that you're to address relative to this har- uh, this, uh, this lo- these laws of the harvest, then here's what will happen. The consequence is coming. A consequence that you need not have to experience. And the Spirit of Christ this morning wants you to lay it all at His feet. He wants you just to admit it, to own it, and say, Lord, this is me, this is where I'm at, And I'm struggling to obey, but I want to obey today. No excuses, no regrets. I want to move on with you. And so I just want you to close your eyes. We're going to pray. And I'm going to ask you to do two things while we pray. I want you to, as I pray, I want you to silently whisper to the Lord, if there's a matter that you know you have refused to obey in, And you've been operating as if there's no consequence. Because if you're doing that, you're actually attempting to mock God. And mark my word, God cannot be mocked. And the reason He can't be mocked is because the Creator of this universe has provided a way for you to move on in Him. And if you refuse to to take advantage of the help that He gives you, There's a natural consequence that's coming. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we come to you and we say thank you. We say thank you that we do not even have to live with the ongoing consequences of being caught in sin our whole lives. But God, I pray this morning on behalf of myself and on behalf of this body that you'd call us again to a place of obedience like Ahab, that as we have heard from your voice this morning, that you have put your finger on the thing in me that you've been wanting to work on, that in repentance we fall at your feet and say, Lord Jesus, move in me. We own that thing before you. Just with your eyes closed and before the Father, I want you to now quietly covenant with him that you'll go tell another brother in Christ that you trust that thing that you know that you've been fighting him on and ask him to pray for you uh, sometime this week. Covenant before the Lord right now, will you? In Jesus' name, amen.